it's either in boundaries or seven habits of highly effective people. I think it's seven habits of highly effective people, but it gives this example of these parents that come to a pastor for counseling and they're like, our son is just lazy. He won't get a job. And, you know, the counselor, pastor, whatever says, well, he's right. He doesn't have any problems. You've taken all the problems from him. <laughs> and like he's really content and happy with how things are going because you've eliminated everything that is problem. Like problems aren't a bad thing for kids. Welcome to Scalay Sisters, where we are cultivating the maximum number of thinking moms we can. This is the podcast for classical homeschooling mamas who yearn for something more than just checking boxes and getting it all done. Scalay Sisters discusses topics that matter to those of us who believe that educating ourselves through reading widely, thinking deeply, and applying faithfully equips us for the task of educating our children. I'm your host, Brandi Benzel. To get my free, almost weekly, mostly Charlotte Mason newsletter, Go to afterthoughtsblog.net slash subscribe and sign up. My co-hosts today are Misty Winkler and Abby Wall. Misty is a homeschooling mom of five, including two graduates. She writes and podcasts at simplyconvivial.com and is the author of two excellent books, The Convivial Homeschool and Simplified Organization. Abby is basically the queen of the school A sistership. Abby is a country living farmer, rancher, a loving wife, and mom of five who homeschools and reads whenever she can. Are you ready for our annual homeschool essentials retreat? This year's topic is attention, because without attention, you cannot learn. Join us live on October 5th, 2024 for a full day of refreshment as we look deeply into this topic. We cannot wait to spend time with you all. Register today by going to scolysisters.com slash attention. That's scolysisters.com slash attention. In today's episode, Misty, Abby, and I discuss the idea of natural consequences and a perspective shift that can really de-stress your motherhood. You're going to love this conversation. And so without further ado, let's get to it. Let's start off with our school A every day. Who would like to go first? This is Abby, and I can go first. All right. I am preparing to teach a literature class for high school students at one at my co-op this year. And the other teacher is doing Dave Raymond's modernity. And so she asked me to just throw together a literature class that would go along with that. And so just throw I got it together. Yeah, just throw it together. <laughs> and then she gave me like a week to come up with the book list and the finalized plan. So I was like, wait a minute, modernity covers a lot of time. And in Dave Raymond's, it covers basically 1600 on. And so I was like, wow. that's a lot of time to cover. Yeah. Luckily, they kind of had a suggested reading list. So I got to kind of choose from those, but some of them just weren't going to be an option. And then some of them I chose because I've already read them quite a few times. So that's helpful. But one that I read this summer to prepare that I had not read before is Cry the Beloved Country by Mm. Alan Patton. And it was kind of funny because some of the books that I chose, a lot of them had to do with fathers and sons and redemption. So those Mm. are some of the key themes that keep emerging throughout. Um, We're going to do A Tale of Two Cities, and Pinocchio as well. So a lot of these things keep coming up. So I'm really looking forward to doing this one. And I did end up getting the Cana Academy. Hmm. Andrew Zwimmerman, is that how we say it? Zwimmerman? Zwimmerman, okay, there we go. (laughs) From Cana Academy, who who did our spring training this last year on um, history, I, I got one of the guides because I thought, oh, that might be helpful for Cry the Beloved Country. I have just been really, really loving the book. It's beautifully written. It's sad, but Mm. there's also just a wonderful discussion of apartheid and the different cultures and the different um, unique struggles of both culture and class and what it means to pass on culture and maintain and what happens when we have estranged fathers and sons 
anyway, it's been a really beautiful book and I highly recommend it if you have not read it. I haven't. Yeah, it's I think it's on the AO list as well in the later years, but which it's, might be why I own it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't so, know why I've never gotten to it. Hmm. Yeah. But very good. And it's different because um I wanted to have a couple different books from you know different locations because we're gonna do to kill a mockingbird as well, which mm. is dealing with race relations in a totally different way. But I don't know. Anyway, and then we're gonna finish it up with Animal Farm and the Communist Manifesto because I get to do what I want because this is my class. Mm-hmm. But I thought nice. that would be a really great way to introduce kid these, mm. you know, high schoolers to Marxism and all of the things that are going on now. So. Oh, it's totally great. I did that last year with, yeah. well, my then 11th grader. I did Communist Manifesto and then Animal Farm. It was great. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, this is Misty. And I just finished yesterday Bad Therapy. It's by Abigail Schreier. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of all over the place right now. <laughs> yes. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> And I'm so glad that it is. It was so good. Mm -hmm. I think anyone would benefit from reading it. Actually, I was thinking as I got to the end, if you had a friend who wasn't ready to read Failure of Nerve and maybe needed a baby step into the same ideas, Mm. bad therapy would do it. I mean, she's not at all trying to say the same thing really but she's getting at the reason why we have no nerve and really it's it's a more fundamental or basic problem than even failure of nerve gets at you have to get rid of the bad therapy before you're ever gonna get some nerve or be ready to hear what friedman has to say yeah it's really disturbing it is (laughs) it's just (laughs) well and it explains a number of things that i've seen but didn't understand so i couldn't understand why it seemed like certain types of parenting were acceptable or why certain parents i shouldn't say certain parents I, i guess why certain kids were perceived as not being able to handle something or i don't know like there's just been these different what I would consider to be strange assumptions about kids. Right. And I didn't know where they were coming from, but I think we're on the second generation of this, maybe. Yes. It's unbelievable that you could get to a second generation of this. (laughs) They're so handicapped. But a part of what she says is that the, the basic assumption of therapists and primarily of the therapeutic approach in public schools is that you assume trauma. You basically treat everyone as if they've been traumatized and it keeps you in trauma. The thing is, it's not actually the way, like they're not actually helping, but they are successfully yeah, handicapping our children. Her subtitle is why the kids aren't growing up. That is what she gets at. It was funny. At the end of the book, she has a part where she says, you know, parents should actually enjoy their kids. And mm-hmm. I mean, it's just actually so heartbreaking because, of course, yeah. if if your kids are hitting you and you have no control over the situation at all, then how could you enjoy parenting? Mm -hmm. But how sad is it that she has to tell people (laughs) you can enjoy your kids. And if you don't, like you're doing something wrong. Right. Wow. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it just is so sad. It reminds me of the Great Depression, which I know sounds weird, but years ago, we read this book by Amity Schles, who's sort of an economist. I don't remember if she's officially an economist, 
But she wrote a book called The Forgotten Man. It was about the Great Depression and all this. And one of the ideas I remember taking away from that was this idea that government policies were perhaps well-intentioned, right? but actually prolonged the pain and the problem. Yes. And more people suffered than needed to because of the intervention. And it reminds me of that. It would be one thing if the intervention actually made people better faster. So your dog dies and you're pretty torn up about it. Wouldn't it be great if, I don't know. I mean, I don't think you can rush grief, but wouldn't it be great if you could, right? (laughs) But this is like, she says in the book, by sending you to therapy because your dog died, you send the message that you can't even handle something as small as your dog dying. Mm -hmm. Which means you're not equipped for life. And so it not only prolongs the grief over the dog because of the way that counseling goes over and over and over whatever it is that happened. What does she call that? Ruminating. Mm -hmm. But not only is it doing that, it's also handicapping you and preventing you from being able to deal with future pain. So it's like all around exaggerating a situation that was, I mean, bad, but in the scheme of things, like a normal kind of bad. Yeah. And then on top of that, it's not just the kids or families or parents who are in official therapy, but that the principles of bad therapy are all through the school system. So it's emotional learning, right? That's exactly right. So that there's more bad therapy than actual education happening. (laughs) Yeah, And then it is the basis of parenting advice out there, you know, gentle parenting or whatever is basically bad therapy. (laughs) I really don't understand it in the sense of I have never been comfortable with people that I do not know intimately taking it upon themselves to offer some sort of counsel to my children. Like having private, very personal conversations with my kids. Yeah. It was just not. No. Something. No, it's not, so it's not like, something you should do. So like why I just, I can't fathom allowing it as a matter of principle. And I just mean stopping at the idea of an adult that I don't know is having an intimate personal conversation with my child alone. Mm-hmm. Like to me, that's all I need to know to put the kibosh on that. <laughs> right. Which would be the official therapy. And then part of what she says is If your kid is in public school, that is happening with or without your permission. (laughs) Right. I don't know how anyone could listen to bad therapy and still, or read bad therapy and still have their kids in public school. It's just like one nail in the coffin. Like there are so many directions you could come at it, but this one alone, if it was just by itself, it's like, what are we doing? (laughs) Okay. But, but even private schools are doing this. Oh, that's true. She brings in examples of private prep schools, Mm -hmm. like if there is social emotional learning. Right. uh, It's a trendy thing. So even even private schools are doing it. That's true. we, We had a very respectable private school in our city in California, where we moved from. And it was... It was known for being strong on a few different things. And they've made a lot of changes over the last couple of years. And one of the things they added, they announced they're adding for this coming school year is social emotional learning. Why? And I was just, I, I, I do not know. I really don't know because I don't see any parents demanding that. And I see a lot of parents getting really nervous about it. So I don't know. My friend is in a master's program currently at a local-ish school and it's, she's going for therapy and she's like, I hate the social emotional learning and this, this type of therapy. And she's like, but you would not believe how many young idealistic kids are coming in and this is what they love. They love talking about their feelings and all these things. So there's, she's like, the science is not there to back it up. And while she's in this graduate program, she's like, yeah, there's there's a few of us. And she's like, and usually it's the ones who are older, who have had kids and, you know, are 
have done other things in our lives and coming back to school. <laughs> and she's like, and there's just a lot of these young feelers that are hmm. really into this type of thing because, you know, why wouldn't, you know, these people are drawn to talking about their feelings anyway. And so they're pushing a lot of that into what they're going to be practicing. I just feel like it makes children so vulnerable in the sense that they're being trained to just talk about your feelings with anybody. Yeah. Really. Yeah. And I just how unhealthy that is and how it opens them up to ridicule or really unnecessary hurt. Because really, I'm not against talking about feelings. I'm just against talking about feelings with everybody. <laughs> and all the time. And all the time. That's the That's only true. thing that That's you talk true. about. That they dictate everything. Right. Well, yeah, I don't want my feelings to be my boss. But I mean, yes. if I need to talk about my feelings, I'm going to talk with a trusted person in private, I'm not going to broadcast my feelings on the internet or to my classmates in my classroom, which is what's happening in these schools. I just, yeah. mm -hmm. it just seems so dangerous. And kids can really, kids can be so cruel. I mean, they sniff weakness sometimes. <laughs> and, sometimes? Yeah. <laughs> well, I like to think that some kids are kinder than others. Yes, they are. <laughs> there are. There are. But anyway, I just feel like you we really could be setting kids up for I mean I think we're actually encouraging bullying when we do stuff like that because you never oh, yeah. really know who the bullies are at first, but you are airing everybody's weaknesses and bullies prey on weakness. So you're actually allowing kids that maybe could have hidden something to now become vulnerable. Oh yeah. I'm sure we could yeah. go on and on. It's terrible. It is. <sighs> okay. Mine, my school day every day, is a reread of Leisure, the Basis of a Culture, which really is kind of the book for School A Sisters in the sense that this is where the name of School A Sisters originates from. And I don't have anything particular to say about it <laughs> because I feel like I've beat this drum, you know, over the years. We've all beat the drum over the years. So other than that, it's really good. And it really was worth rereading. And it did remind me of this idea of the ideal being total work. And I mean, like negative ideal. So he says, if we're not careful, this becomes the ideal. The ideal becomes total work where your activities are justified by you know, earning an income or looking busy or something. And just this idea that one of the reasons why we homeschool is so kids can have intangible, non-monetary types of benefits. Things that can't easily be measured. Non-utilitarian. Right. And it was just a good reminder of, I mean, I, I like anybody, like to see my kids being, you know, productive human beings and... <laughs> Especially now that they're teenagers and all of that. But it was just good to remember about, uh, well, even I think sometimes the pressure on moms. I know some moms where people assume that their time, I'm trying to think of how to put this. They just get a lot of pressure on, uh, from the outside to volunteer a lot or do this a lot or that a lot or whatever. And it's this idea of like, you should be in the world of total work in some way. And if, if you're not earning a living, then the least you could do is give free work to people like people outside your family. Anyway, it's just an interesting mentality. I was actually talking with the gal and I sent her a quote and I was like, this makes me think of you and your situation <laughs> because this idea that like things are only justified if they're work. And so we have trouble explaining how, well, I'm nursing a baby right now and how that's an important use of your time. You know, it just, mm -hmm. anyway. So I appreciate him. And he's, I think he's just worth reading every few years to kind of rip ourselves out of the modern mindset in the right way. Because I feel like the whole like me time slash self-care thing, not against it, but I, we set up this false dichotomy of, there's the world of total work and then we're going to reject that. And so the other option is self-indulgence and self-comfort. Mm -hmm. And he really sets up a third way of there's just something that's totally other and a way that you could spend your time that adds richness to life and adds benefit to others, 
but that isn't necessarily, I mean, some people might put some of the things that he talks about into like a self-care category. That's why it gets a little muddled, but I'm just saying it's just interesting. Like the, uh, the, the opposite of work isn't selfishness, I guess. Anyway, it's interesting. Yeah. Especially utilitarian materialistic work. Right. Yes. And, and that that actually pushes us into sloth mm-hmm. or like Korean between acting like a utilitarian widget machine or I'm going to be slothful. And like neither of those is a human way of being. No, I feel like I did that all summer though. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I did this mad swing between overworking myself and then like a version of sloth that was really bordering on burnout, you know? And then it was like, okay, I got to get it back together and do it again. It was really unhealthy. I should have read Leisure earlier in the summer. (laughs) It was a needed correction. Sistership is the place for homeschooling moms to talk about ideas, educational philosophy, and the practicalities of lifelong learning. While we all come from different backgrounds, traditions, states, and even countries, we are all committed to self-education, joyfully learning alongside our children, and homeschooling well for the long haul. We help one another avoid burnout by reading widely, thinking deeply, and applying faithfully. Sistership is free to join, free from ads, and most importantly, free from drama. Join thousands of thinking moms in Sistership. Go to schoolwaysisters.com slash sistership. Come for the conversation and stay for the fun. I think I like the title that I have hypothetically given this episode. (laughs) I called it de-stress with natural consequences. So we're going to talk about giving our children natural, natural consequences, but I really want us eventually to back up and talk about a way bigger paradigm. I, I think there is a tension inside of homeschooling because there are natural consequences that we know that kids would have in school that don't exist in homeschooling, or at least by natural, we mean imposed by someone other than mom. Sure. And okay. I was going to say, because yeah. we were thinking like, that's actually nothing natural about yeah. the school setting and those consequences. Right. I mean, but I, I just think like people think, oh, well, if I put my kid in this class, then he would reap these consequences that I didn't have to impose. Sure. But because he's sitting here right in front of me, if I don't provide consequences, then it's immoral because I'm basically granting that child license. Yeah. But then when I invent consequences, they don't always feel quote natural or effective. At the same time, we've been reading a lot of Edwin Friedman. And so we read failure of nerve inside sistership. And then, well, I sent some pictures to Abby because she didn't have this book yet, but Misty and I both have generation to generation, which is a different book that he wrote. And so in the context of these books, one of the things he talks about that gave me a huge aha moment was this idea that when mothers are experiencing stress, it's because they're triangled with their child and then some other person or an issue that the child has. So we hear, right, like, how do I make my child more responsible? How do I make my child um, have a better relationship with his sister? How do I make, like, there's a lot of this make, right? And I'm feeling I'm feeling all of the stress. I see a problem and I'm carrying the weight of that problem around. And then my child just like kind of seems like this slacker. And I start worrying more because I'm worried that he's not worried enough. (laughs) Right. So it turns into this really stressful thing. We have this idea of like not being punctual, dawdling over math, whatever it is. And so with Friedman, he really talks about this idea of shifting responsibility. So I'm feeling stress, but it's not actually supposed to be my stress, especially if it's teenagers. And so there's a way of thinking of natural consequences, in my opinion, that we can get glean from this. So, but first we have to go way back because I want to define all of our terms and make sure we know what we're talking about and all this kind of stuff. So, oh, but the one thing I want to talk about is before we start (laughs) is Friedman's paradox. Cause I do think it's important to notice this. He says in one of his books, he calls it Friedman's or or I called it Friedman's paradox. He calls it a paradox. If you decide to make someone do something or be something, it always backfires. So if you're trying to 
make siblings have a closer relationship, you're driving them apart. If you try to make your child more responsible, you actually make them more irresponsible. It's this weird paradox. And he kind of has a paradigm for that that we're going to talk about. But so we're trying to get past all of that into something that's more effective and allows us to de-stress. That's my goal for this conversation. With that said, let's start with a really good definition of triangling, because I think this needs to be well understood if we're going to be able to have this conversation, because we're going to start throwing around the word triangle, and we need to make it really clear what we mean. And it's actually pretty tricky to understand. (laughs) Yeah, well, I feel like you do a pretty good job. I've heard you explain it before in a way I thought you did a pretty good job. So that means you have to do it. (laughs) (laughs) So if you think of a three-legged stool, a three-legged stool has stability. And if you removed one of those legs, then the stool would fall over, right? It takes three to be stable. And that's kind of the principle that he's using with the triangle, a three-sided thing, that any relationship has some third element to it that keeps it stable. So if two people or a person in an issue have some kind of friction, difficulty, when there's not stability between two people, to bring stability, their attention and energy will be directed to a third thing. And then that third thing can look like the problem that you have to fix when it's actually a symptom, it's not the real problem. The The triangled thing isn't the cause. And if you change things up, it will also have unintended consequences, negative or positive. Like there are good triangles and bad triangles. There are healthy and unhealthy triangles, which is part of what makes it difficult while reading some of his some of Friedman's sections because he talks in some sections about triangles being necessary to stability. But then whenever he's talking about dysfunction, there's some kind of improper triangling going on. Do you guys think that all blaming is triangling? That could be. Because part of what he says is that the triangled thing, when there's tension between two people and they want to stay stable together, so they redirect. So it is kind of a scapegoating effect because they're channeling, they're each channeling their base, their, their negative energy, their conflict, their anxiety in Friedman's terms, they're channeling their anxiety to this other person or thing. And then they no longer have the anxiety pointed at each other. So they're united, but it's in an unhealthy way. So like when your kids are fighting, instead of working it out themselves, they come to you and shift their problems to you. And that is what? Is that, I mean, sometimes they actually need help learning how to resolve things. I'm assuming children that have kind of been trained, like there's definitely, and I think this is where it gets difficult with children too. Like when your baby is born, you are completely triangled between it and survival and you should be. Yeah. Yeah. This is where in failure of nerve, where he's talking about leaders, he says the solution to unhealthy triangles isn't to cut those toxic people out of your life, right? It isn't to detriangle by cutting yourself out of it and saying, I'm not going to do anything for you. It's actually to be the non-anxious presence in the triangle. So they might be aiming their anxiety at you, but it's up to you if you, if you are the triangled person here. Are you going to absorb it and become the focal point of their anxiety and bear it for them? Or are you going to remove the anxiety from the triangle? Can you de-escalate it? And that's actually a leader's job. 
And so I think in the case of siblings fighting, you would help them resolve it without fighting yourself, You're without mm-hmm. jumping into the fray and becoming a part of the situation. The only way to coach them through it is to help each one of them recognize where they went wrong and what they do to set it right. There's no need for anxiety and conflict in this situation because we know a better path forward here. We can make it better. Yeah. So a lot of Friedman's work and the reason I think it resonated with me so much. And when we initially talked about the book, I was like, oh, well, that's, that's just like Alcoholics Anonymous, um, Mm Alan Hahn, and some of the things that I've experienced through my childhood upbringing, because I did have family members who went through a 12 step program and things like that. And also why boundaries is a really good book for people that Mm. go with some of these triangling behaviors because it is a complex topic and Friedman, while he hits on it, it it goes way further and it Mm -hmm. sometimes. So Mm -hmm. one of the phrases that they use in recovery programs is detachment. And it talks about like detachment is neither kind nor unkind. It is not a judgment or condemnation. It's just, it's a separation from ourselves from the adverse effects of another person's behavior or alcoholism. And it doesn't necessarily require a physical separation. It just helps us to look at our situations realistically and objectively. And it allows us to let go of our obsessions with another's behavior and begin to lead happier and more manageable lives. And you can still love a person and not like the behavior. So it's a lot of that kind of things that we are seeking a solution as being a non-anxious presence is that that's very much what detachment is, is that you can remove yourself from the emotional part of it and, and look at it in a calm manner, which is easier said than done. And it's something that, you know, most of us need a lot of support (laughs) to help with, which is, you know, oftentimes why we bring in, you know, dads and Mm -hmm. other people to talk through things with, because in the heat of the moment, it's very emotional. But I think that Misty and I were at an educators conference a couple weeks ago, and one of the things that they talked about was how the Trinity is three parts. And he did a beautiful job of explaining how no one was better than, like, I think of the Trinity as being the perfect triangular, you know, that that triangle, mm. right? That it is there there is no imbalance and each has its part and is even more in the whole and i think that that is why ultimately right trinity we are we have the father we have the son we have the holy spirit each working its own part each being the three in one and like i said the, the man who did the explanation of the trinity was it was a beautiful idea and he gave examples of just that's that's what we should be aiming for. And I think that the emotional triangle is, yes, there is some of that blame shifting and things like that. But if we are seeking that leadership point, it's because it, it's that it's that unity in the whole that we're trying to offer that solution. Like when things work together, it's very, very good. When it doesn't mm-hmm. work, it gets very unstable and blame shifting happens and there's always, you know, that back and forth rather than that kind of continuous strength from all three parts. It's really interesting. I had not thought of the Trinity relating to triangles. So that's really interesting to think about like Mm -hmm. that there's an ideal, I guess that feeds into Misty's statement that not all triangles are bad, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's helpful. Another way I've heard it, it was in a a sermon here. He didn't use the phrase triangle, but I did <laughs> in my notes. He said basically <laughs> every relationship you have should be triangled with God. Yeah, for sure. God can bear all your anxiety. And we're told, cast all your cares on him. So when I think of a triangle, in every triangle, the 
anxiety is being channeled to one point. And it's like, can that point bear it? And I think that part of what Friedman says is that we're all in these complex molecules of triangles. Mm -hmm. And so as long as there's like this free flowing sharing of the anxiety, like nothing really breaks out. It's when too much anxiety gets exerted on one point. Yes. But if we can relate to one another in such a way that God is a point in the triangle, he can bear all the anxiety. And so Mm -hmm. we don't have to, and we don't have to push it to the other people either. Mm -hmm. It's not us or them. I actually wrote that in my copy of Generation to Generation when he's talking about different electrical networks. And he's talking about, you know how like there's the whole, the old fashioned Christmas lights where when one bulb goes out, then everything after it goes out. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember what he called that. He used the real word for it. (laughs) And I didn't, I still don't know the real word for it, even though I read the book, but then he talks about how then a lot of human relationships are like that versus if everyone is plugged in to the power source directly if you're in a family, then when one bulb goes out, it's not like the whole <laughs> the whole tree goes out, right? And in my notes, I put, you know, that's probably the ideal of that then is every person being, quote, plugged into God in the sense of like, that's where you're getting your bearings from. That's where you're casting your anxiety when you need to. That, you know, when you're, when you're plugged in there, then these other things, yes, the bulb next to you might go out, but you're not as affected. Mm-hmm. With that said, I feel like today the types of triangles we're talking about are actually the ones that are malfunctioning in some way. And mom is carrying this burden of stress for some reason. The question that comes up is my child has problem X. What would be good natural consequences for X? That's kind of the general sense that I see. And so I think we should define natural consequences because I'm not sure that everybody uses that term the same way. Or even just consequences. Yeah. Whether or not they're natural or not. I mean, a natural consequence of skipping breakfast is that you're hungry, right? Like no no one has to do anything for it to happen. But if you don't clean your room, you can't go play with friends. Like it makes sense, but it is imposed. Right. I think that's where some of the confusion comes from. Ultimately, the natural consequences are, you know, like you break it, you buy it, <laughs> right? Yeah. That That's like the very natural sort of thing. So then when there doesn't seem to be any consequences that will happen if I don't step in, then people are looking for what they call natural consequences. And so I think... I have a couple questions. Do you guys make a mental distinction between consequences and punishment? Some people do. Yeah, I don't really think of anything that we do as parents as punishment. Because, I mean, our sin has been punished in Christ's death. Right. So there's nothing that you can do. It It would be impossible for you to pay for your sin. And that's what a punishment is supposed to be. And so everything we do as parents is for discipline and training and restoration, not for making you pay. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) I love the way you said it is the reason why I'm thanking you because I think that was really great. Yes. So we're not, it's not retribution Mm -hmm. and it's for your good. If I dish out consequences to you, I am working for your good in some way in that moment. Do you think there is a difference between natural consequences and just regular consequences? I do think so. Sometimes we talk about natural consequences and we just mean maybe common sense consequences. Because I do think that if we were getting like super pedantic, 
mm-hmm. a natural consequence is something that doesn't even need to be imposed. True. So you skip breakfast, you're hungry, you climb high and fall off, you get hurt. Nature itself actually takes care of yes. it. Yes. Mm-hmm. And even like you break it, you buy it is a good principle, but it still takes parents imposing that to make it actually happen. True. Because all the time people break things and don't buy it. <laughs> like <laughs> That actually takes some law enforcement to make mm-hmm. happen. <laughs> True. Good point. So it's a principle. It's, it's an enforced principle of justice. As much as we say, oh, yeah, natural consequence, there are a lot of things that we keep our kids from <laughs> actually doing that would have, uh, you know, natural consequences, right? Mm. I mean... <laughs> So we don't let them have the freedom no. to do something where they would. No, I mean, it makes it really uncomfortable if you do. And, you know, some of it would be <laughs> probably neglectful. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think that there is sometimes, yes, you, you know, babies touch a hot stove once. It's, you know, you've probably warned them even. And sometimes it does happen, mm-hmm. right? But there are just, there are some yeah. things that we do not. Yeah. You don't, it's not the only way for people to yeah. learn things. It isn't. <laughs> right. True. Yes. And it gets, I, I think like it you, gets you slap hard to their do. hand. Yeah. As an imposed consequence. Yeah. A smaller pain because the natural pain is, yeah, sticking a fork in the socket or, you know, putting their hand in the fireplace or something you don't want to happen. So you. Yes. As the mother of a child who did stick a piece of silverware <laughs> in an outlet. I would just like to say that the hand slap is definitely less damaging. Oh my gosh. Anyway, I just thought I'd say that. I actually think the hand slap thing is helpful when we talk about natural consequences versus regular consequences. Because like when you're working with a toddler and they're trying to play with an outlet and you give them a little hand hand slap, you're substituting the small pain for the bigger pain Mm -hmm. and possible long-term consequences. Mm -hmm. But I think what starts to fall apart is like, for example, if I, if I had allowed that toddler to use screens and then I'm like, oh, you did that. I'm taking your screens away. There's like a total disconnect between that behavior and the consequence I just dished out. And it doesn't make any sense to a toddler. And I think we all know that. But as kids get older, we feel like we want the consequences to be tied more closely in the way that the hand slap that was representative of actual pain is tied. I think that's what we think of as natural consequences is like, well, in the real world, X, Y, Z would happen. It would be pain or it would be this, or it would be that. And so I want to somehow imitate nature. Yeah. And what I'm doing. And so if you didn't do your laundry and I take away your screen, that like may or may not make any sense. Mm -hmm. And I think we feel like the ideal is for what we're what we're doing to make sense. I don't know that it always can make sense. <laughs> but I think maybe that's what we're getting at when we talk about natural consequences is we're trying to think of something. And so what gets difficult is when it's school stuff, when it is, well, I assigned my child to write an essay and I said it was due on Friday and she didn't turn it in then I feel like, gosh, all the things that would happen in the real world, if I imitate that, she's still not going to care. So now what do I do to deal with this situation? And I feel like that's where the natural consequences stuff is falling apart, where the parents ultimately can't make the child care, Mm -hmm. but they feel like they should be able to. And so that's a lot of stress to carry around. And so then natural consequences actually becomes a really stressful thing. Like, how do I even think of them? In fact, thinking of them in the moment can be really difficult. Right. Well, this is where the subtitle of failure of nerve comes in, which is leadership in the age of the quick fix. Mm. When parents are looking for natural consequences or whatever language they use, I think if you dug to the root of it, they have an outcome that they want to achieve and they're looking for the magic secret sauce that they can install and get the result they want. They're not actually looking for 
training up and discipling their children, which is a really long-term thing. Hmm. They're looking for a quick fix. If I just found the right consequence, then I would get the outcome I'm looking for. And that's not actually, it doesn't work. And so they just get more and more anxious. And it's that same thing too. It's like, well, maybe I need to switch math curriculums because this right. one, oh, yes. isn't working. Yes. <laughs> it's it's looking for that thing that doesn't require pain or suffering, right? Like part mm-hmm. of the learning process is the hard work of doing it and then the keeping the kids accountable. And it's, yeah, it's like, well, maybe if I find the right, not punishment, but consequence, then they will do what they need to do. And, or I need to find the right curriculum and then they'll do it with cheerful attitude, right? Like, Mm -hmm. or you come at it with your own bad therapy approach and say, if we just had the most heartfelt conversation, they would be fixed. Yes. (laughs) But it's like fixing another person. Yeah. That is your goal. And, and that's where it's going wrong. That's where the triangling comes in. Mm -hmm. Because it's actually you and your child and you're trying to have a third thing that you're channeling your energy at so that it's not directed at your child or it's your child and some other thing and you are taking all their anxiety on yourself. Yes. I just keep going back to this idea that what I see with parents of teenagers is they don't think their kids are worried enough. So now they're worried even more. Right. Because they're worried about the situation and they're worried that their kid isn't worried about the situation. <laughs> yeah. So it's like double levels, like this two tiers of stress and anxiety that's going on. I want to read a quote. It's from Generation to Generation okay. on page 49. And this just really... This was where some of my aha moments came from when I was thinking about this topic. He says, the problem is that we cannot make another family member responsible by trying to make him or her responsible. (laughs) The very act of trying to make others responsible preempts their own responsibility. And I thought that is why it's so difficult. We can't, like, we are actually powerless. I don't know if I would say that we are powerless. We just have a different role than the one that we're trying to insert ourselves into. Fair. Yes. Okay. I mean, we're powerless to make, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. I don't think we're powerless to build. Right. Well, it's like Cindy used to say that we're not the potter. We try, if we try to be the potter, you know, our children are the clay and we try to be the potter. We're trying to do something. That's that's not the way it's actually set up. So it's not going to work because we aren't the potter. They are clay and we aren't the potter. Let's say I have a teenage son in my house. I don't. So please don't judge my child. (laughs) But let's say I have a teenage boy in my house that is not doing his math. So then, I mean, according to Friedman, I can't make him more responsible. I am freaking out. So I'm triangled (laughs) with this child and his math. So then what is the proper response on my part? Like pretend you're counseling me. You guys tell me what to do, or maybe a better thing is how to be. What do you mean he's not doing his work? (laughs) (laughs) That's true. I mean, there are a lot of different ways that could happen that would necessitate a different approach. Yeah. I was like, what kind of attitude is it is it outright Um, rebellion yeah is it just sloth let's say procrastination so just foolishness so i'm dawdling over my assignment all day and i'm 12 let's say that let's get real specific i know i said teenager but let's say 12 Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, we, I just think we see this a lot at age 12 is why I went ahead and reverted right. to 12 because it's a common thing. It is. It is. And, and it's where it's like, you're not going to go do anything else till the math is done. And I think this yeah. is where people get really, if especially if they're super Charlotte Mason and it's like, no, but I can't make him do anything for more than 10 minutes. 
<laughs> yeah. I was like, I'm sorry, you're sitting here till this is done. And then I'm going to correct it. You can run or work or you do something physical while I correct it. You're not doing anything else. I mean, possibly not even eating until it's done. Yeah. But you you have to be able to hold a line and not let that freak you out as a mom, I guess. Mm hmm which is the hard part because, and especially, you know, having just read bad therapy, parents have just imbibed from the culture, the idea that they, they should never cause tension or friction in a relationship, or it's their job to make sure their kids are happy all the time. You can have a really messed up view of what a parent's job is that makes it impossible for you to actually parent. Yeah. The parent does make their kid do stuff that they don't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think, too, even if you have an older teen who's refusing, like, that's the great thing about teenagers is they have a lot of things that they really want to do that's not math. And if they want to do those things, then that's that's the key to get getting out of you yeah. know, doing is doing the work necessary. And it's amazing to me. My husband always would finish like weeks worth of homeschool work so he could go hunting for a couple weeks mm. each fall. Right. It, it's an amazing motivator to have a parent who holds the line. Actually, you can't go to sports practice or you can't go to your job unless you finish yeah. this, right? Like, these are privileges mm -hmm. outside of it, but you are being educated, you are being homeschooled, and this is required in our home and in our homeschool. And if we just hold the line a few times, it's going to be uncomfortable and it's not going to be fun. And yeah, they're going to be upset about it. But if you do mm -hmm. it, it has long lasting results. Yeah. I actually did that this summer where if you don't do your chores, then you can't go to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it did work really well. But I'm thinking, you know, when we talk about stepping back and seeing a bigger picture, what I'm hearing you say, though, is that it is normal, natural, and yay, verily, even helpful for mm -hmm. teens to have busy, rich lives that they care about. Yes. Right. Yes. That, yes. That's super helpful. It is. <laughs> it is. So I'm thinking about when some of the insulated homeschool families that were around, like 15 years ago, it was really trendy to be a, an insulated homeschool family with even teenagers that were just at home all day. Yeah. They have nothing to live. If you have nothing to live for, you have no motivation for anything. And there's nothing to take away. Like, how do you take away? Because then you put yourself in the position of you're taking away like the one thing that they like at home or yeah. something. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of like guilt involved in doing that because you feel mean. But the solution is what? A richer life? Yeah. A bigger life? Yeah. Yeah. I always said, I don't know how other parents taught their kids motivation or deadline for school because what we we had friends on the same street and so most of our kids had a peer that they knew was waiting for them mm. we had similar school hours so all the moms had a like don't come to our door before you know right. exit time in the day but they knew after that time they assumed their friend was waiting for them and that was their motivation to not get distracted and to like get their work done on time. When we didn't have that, I did feel like I was making stuff up. Hmm. Okay. That makes sense. I think my kids had a lot of that too. They weren't homeschoolers, but we had a lot of kids growing up on the street that were coming home from school at, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon or something. Mm -hmm. And my kids wanted to be, you know, ready for that. And then the one that didn't care about people just wanted to be done with school. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, it was just motivating to not be doing what mom said. <laughs> and, and we also did, you know, if if we did have a, a time where they were being very despondent, like just not wanting to do any schoolwork, 
I usually just pulled out my long list of deep cleaning tasks and just said, that's fine. If you don't want to do school today, here's all of the things that you can do. You will work because we are not lazy in this family. So you either get to do education and learn (laughs) alongside with everyone or you can go to work and I will inspect your work. It usually didn't take very long to realize actually learning is way better than cleaning toilets and, (laughs) you know, doing things (laughs) like that. And I think the key to that is just cheerfully presenting that option to them. Yes. And I think another issue that moms in particular have with consequences is assuming that just having a consequence in place is the preventative measure. And Mm. so if I tell my kid this is going to be the consequence for that behavior, They'll never do the behavior because they don't want the consequence to happen. And that's just not actually the way it works at all. (laughs) (laughs) You're going to have to impose the concept. It's actually experiencing the consequence that teaches, not just seeing it looming ahead. That is kind of an ideal. And I guess that's wisdom eventually. But they get there by experiencing the consequences. So whatever you say is the consequence, just be prepared, you know, especially if it's a boy, two or three times at least expect to actually hold that line and Mm -hmm. make them experience the consequence without mom losing her cool. I think that mom losing her cool undoes the effectiveness as well Mm. because she's done that. She's the one experiencing the anxiety the anger, the frustration, all the things that the child should be working through. It's like she's doing it for him in front of him and he doesn't actually experience the effect of the consequence. Okay, I have another quote. This is also on 49 of Generation to Generation, same page. It's further down though. He says, well, it's even it's half of it. It's not even a whole quote. But he recommends sticking someone with the pain of responsibility for his or her own destiny Mm -hmm. rather than, you know, like trying to comfort them or scolding them or whatever it is. Or emotionally guilt trip them. Right. How could you do Manipulate them. Mm -hmm. For me, that was huge in the sense that I really started viewing natural consequences at that point as a way of detriangling myself and thinking of it as how do I shift the pain from me to them? Mm -hmm. Because it's actually their problem and they need to feel it in order for them to start trying to solve it. Yes. And like I said, like, I do think it's a continuum because, you know, like when we talked about, for example, like the sibling issue. So two kids are fighting and they come to you Well, if they're five and six, they 100% need you to walk them through a whole process. But if they're 16 and 17, you probably can tell them to just work it out if you've trained them (laughs) and may not need to get very involved at all, depending. (laughs) It just kind of depends. It depends. Brothers might be a little. (laughs) Well, that's true. I have, I don't have, I only have one boy in the house. So that might be why I'm saying that. I'm just saying if there's fair, you might have to do some intervention from time to time. That's fair. Sorry. sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. That's true. I hadn't thought about that. Natural consequences might involve broken bones. (laughs) Broken bones or really messed up houses. I was thinking about this. Big boys. You guys, I've, I, my boys are six years apart, so I've never experienced that type of brother stuff. Well, mm. I have been three, two years. Yeah. Two years of each other. Less than it's two just, years. it's just different because yeah. if a boy six years older is, you know, beating up a boy six years, younger, like that's You're right. That's it's a different, so problem. unacceptable. Yes. <laughs> it's yes. Just like, so anyway, I just was thinking of this idea of as is age appropriate. Thinking of natural consequences as part of this whole triangle thing where maturity is them being able to face the situation themselves. I actually should like when when my kid goes to college, I shouldn't be triangled between my kid and his math teacher, right? Yes. There are some triangles that they should outgrow. 
and it's part of growing up. And so seeing it as basically this constant detriangling where I'm shifting the stress from me to them as is age appropriate, it also lowers my stress because I've decided, I don't want to say not to care, but like not to get emotionally involved at the level that maybe I did when my kids were younger. Yeah. And it's just, it's just sometimes those, as they grow up, they're making bigger choices and the consequences are larger, like lo- the long-term impact. So it is really, it's really tough to do. So I will like those younger years, <laughs> Yeah, interventions are smaller and they're less. So yeah. but as they get older, like there's some there's some things. And, and that's part of that letting go process that is so important. I think that's why it's important in the younger years though, to allow it because then they've gotten a chance to practice when the stakes are lower. Mm -hmm. Like if we save it all for when they're 15, 16, 17 years old, that's, it is a higher stakes game. And then it's even harder to bow out if you've never done it before, because you feel like they're going to screw up their whole life or (laughs) do something crazy. I don't know. I just wonder how much of that is doing it gradually all along the way being a helpful thing to do. For sure. Have you ever had a child try to triangle you with your husband? Like they're having a problem with their dad and they come to you. Uh, It's usually the other way around. Is it? (laughs) (laughs) If we're being honest. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, so, yes. see, I have this I have this happen to me all the time and I finally the other day was like I understand what you're saying I'm just not sure why you're talking to me about it <laughs> they were not happy but with that one I just decided to bow out entirely yeah well I think that's like the only option to take I guess I would mm-hmm. have more you know permission asking or idea floating where they talk to me because they know that their dad would say no you know yes, that kind I'm of like the no mom. Stra- yes, the strategic no mom. asking of the right parent uh-huh <laughs> and and i just tell them well that's something you have to talk to your dad about nice yep. and i don't bring it up or like make them because mm-hmm. <laughs> usually i mean I don't care if it happens or not. <laughs> you don't have the guts to ask your dad, then the <laughs> then the defaults no. <laughs> I did one time have, you know, I I've, I've been teaching writing classes since before I had kids. And so I was still quite young when this happened. I think I might have had two kids, little little kids. Mhm not school-aged kids of my own yet. And I was teaching this writing class out of my home. And one of my writing students, so he would have been like 11 or 12, pretty sure he was the oldest. And his mom didn't, I didn't know them. I think I put it on a local homeschool group or someone had told her about it. I didn't know who this family was. He gets dropped off at my house for this class and I couldn't pick his mom out of a crowd. (laughs) You know? Oh, wow. Didn't hear anything from her ahead of time except for her enrolling him in my class. So he's in the class and doesn't do his homework. Like and what he does turn in is just pathetic. Like, <laughs> wow. And so so I would give feedback and then return it, and he wouldn't turn it back in. Or it'd be like the exact same thing. It was just he was not doing any of the work, period. And so, you know, my own wanting straight A's self looks at the situation and says, well, you know, I'm going to get serious. Started giving, putting bad grades, you know, low numbers. And then I went so far and I thought I was really taking it. Like (laughs) I was being so serious. I even put an F on his papers. And like, I felt like that was pain. He didn't care. Wow. He didn't care. And so then he just, he just was not doing the work. And now what I should have done is, you know, communicated to his family. So I was not a very good teacher. (laughs) Oh. Because I was young, you know, I had never even been in class. I was homeschooled. I didn't really understand my, my role in this situation. 
the right thing would have been for me to talk to the parents. I didn't do that. But I also assumed that the mom was looking at the work, right? So my right. As, a, as a homeschool family, coming from a homeschool family, it was my like fourth or fifth class. And usually parents would be in contact with me if they had questions. So I'm sending things home thinking if I'm sending things home, the parents know what we're supposed to be doing. Right. That, w- that was a false assumption. Huh. I found out uh, finally, you know, around the Christmas break, the mom calls me and she said, I just found his homework and I see that he hasn't been doing the work for your class. And I see he's failing your class. And I said, yes, he is. He doesn't do the work. <laughs> and so it turns out he wasn't doing work for her. So she signed yeah. him up for someone else's class. Yep. She was outsourcing the problem and thought that because it was someone else, automatically he would start caring. But of course he didn't. Like, why should he care what I said? I was nobody to him, right? Yeah. And all I can do is put an F on his paper and who really cares? <laughs> you mean it's not a natural consequence? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But because I really have met people who think that if they put their kid in school, it's going to change it. Right. And I don't want to say that never happens. I mean, some kids do wake up in a social setting. Right. But it's something like embarrassment. Like it really does depend on the kid. Yeah. And this kid's goal was to not do any work. And so he didn't care about being embarrassed in front of these other kids he didn't know. Some kids would be. Yeah. Yeah. And he didn't care about performing for another person he didn't know. Some kids would be. But yeah, there isn't a magic, like, just because. Or like me, you know, I thought, oh, putting an F on his paper, like, oof, that'll yeah. wake him up. It's like, no, who really cares? Like, what? what's that actually? How does that affect him long term? Not at all. Yeah. I don't, I have no idea what happened. I, I can't, I don't even know. I don't even remember their names. And like I said, we weren't connected in any way, but I don't think, yeah. But students who don't care, he's like the epitome in my mind. Yeah. And I've had teachers come to me, you know, at co-op settings and he's like, well, he's doing the work, but he's not doing all of the things. And I'm like, uh-huh. I, I understand this. I think an IEW class, like he just really didn't want to do all of the dress ups and the requirements, but he did. He's like, it makes it sound bad. And so that was a choice he was making. I was like, you can mark him down if that's what you really want, but I'm not going to make him do <laughs> the things like he's doing the paper. So, you know, there is a, there is a, I don't know, there's a, there's a fine line on some of those things because calmly explaining to me why he thought that that sounded really terrible. I don't know. It was <laughs> <laughs> did it the first couple times, and then I was like, "This is stupid." So <laughs> I don't know. Those kids. So you're you gotta, saying you agreed with him? <laughs> I kind of thought it was maybe not necessary either, and I just really didn't want to do that battle. Like, like there there are things that we need to choose. Like he was cheerfully doing the papers, just how he thought was a better way, and may cause. <laughs> I don't know. Right. Well. You might then, as the mom, try to make him because you are embarrassed yeah. by the teachers or like wanting to impress the teachers yeah. or caring about the grade. But if you step back from the situation, I mean, I could see going either way and say, yeah. no, you have to submit to the teacher and do whatever it takes to mm-hmm. fulfill requirements. And yeah. that's a fine stand. Or you can say, you can do it your way and accept the teacher's consequences. That's and that's what, but like trying to to mediate and like make everyone happy is the triangling, right? Yeah, and the teacher would have really liked me to care and be more anxious about this problem. That I (laughs) she wanted to bring you in, yes, yes, (laughs) to the direct relationship and yeah, yeah, to stabilize it. Yep, and I said, uh, no, no, thank you. I'm assuming that, well, maybe not. I don't know. Since then, you guys have maybe been in, say, a co-op situation or something where you had a child that wasn't doing the work for your class. 
yeah, it's after that point, it's only been my own children who haven't done the work for my classes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and I've had other kids and my own not do the work, but it, I will say that I think for the most part, it didn't become a habitual thing. Yeah. I, I think it happens to everyone and yeah. forgetfulness, yeah. Uh, lack of desire to do it. Like there, there's things that happen and well, okay, then you didn't get it done. And when we get home, you will still have to do it. So, I mean, that's the thing is mm, I can make yeah. my kids redo things at home when they don't show up to class prepared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And most of my classes have been, yeah. have started at the ages where I feel like it's the training wheels time where all these homeschool kids are learning what it means to have homework and turn it in. Mm hmm I'm not very uptight about it either. Yeah. So I probably wouldn't even remember if someone hadn't turned it in because I figure part of the point is teaching them what a deadline means. Yeah. But ever since that point, actually, I've also only had friends' kids <laughs> in my classes. <laughs> so where I yeah. could call them up and say, hey, yeah. they, need, they still need to do this. And then I know that it will get done. <laughs> yep. Right. Yeah, I had a couple kids at co-op that maybe didn't want to do all the work or forgot it or were forgetting their papers. So like they were doing the work, but then, oh, I left my paper at home or, you know, like there was just, I felt, I don't know, I felt like I had a year or two where there was kind of this rash of low, it was low level irresponsibility. It wasn't horrible um, and they weren't rebellious. I really spent a lot of time trying to think about actually how I, I didn't put it in these words at the time, but like how to make them feel the pain and consequences of those decisions without triangling their mothers. Mm. I was trying not because I just kept thinking, I don't know, for me, I appreciate it when someone else also drives home the need to be responsible to my kids. <laughs> And it doesn't yeah. feel like I am alone in demanding performance. And so, I mean, if it had gotten beyond my ability to handle it, I would have talked to the moms, but I just had to figure out what was painful. And, and I, and I went through times where I realized like certain consequences don't work. Like I remember telling, I made someone run laps only to realize that half of my class thought running laps sounded more like more fun than my class. <laughs> and so that was not working it's like punishing an introvert with time alone right like it just wasn't going to happen so yeah. I it was it got tricky for a while there and then I eventually kind of figured out I don't know customized consequences for some of these kids and then and then they were fine about halfway through mm -hmm. it really was about not letting it become a habit though Abby I'm, Abby, I'm glad you brought that up because it it could have I think if I hadn't have stepped in and yeah, I think it would have just been a constant struggle the whole year with like half of my class not doing their homework or something. And our friend, Betsy, she always, anytime she teaches a class, she always prints out a coupon for each student. And it's like, I can't remember, but it's like, basically you get one free excuse and mm. it's life went crazy and I didn't do it. And it's not, I need more time. Like it just is like, it's just a grace and forgiveness thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes just having that out makes it so kids want to use it really carefully. She said like the first week, there's always a handful of kids who use it the first week. And then <laughs> almost all the other kids almost never use it. Or there's truly an emergency, you know, a family yeah. emergency that comes up and happens and you just can't get to your homework. So I kind of like that idea. She had a funny name for it, but I'm sorry, I'm forgetting it. But I thought, oh, that's a great, that's a great way to mm -hmm. do it because we do sometimes need an out for crazy weeks that just didn't go to plan. And, you know. It can be hard with a co-op class, you know, yeah. unless you know all the particular situations to know, is it the kid's irresponsibility or the parents? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually found last year with doing the pro jib and having everyone read their paper up front mm -hmm. was actually the best motivating factor for everyone remembering yes. their homework. Like they actually needed it in class 
and it would be super obvious to everyone if they forgot it. Yep. Yeah. They, they wanted to have their work for class. There was a reason and not just, I said they needed to turn it in. Right. Because I also never give grades, so it's not like I can just mark down points. Yeah, either. I know what you mean. Yep. That is one of the areas that makes the quote natural consequences thing tricky is because when people are thinking of, well, what are the natural consequences of this? And it's like, oh, getting an F would be a natural consequence at mm -hmm. school, but I don't give grades. And so now what do I do? <laughs> you know, I mean, like, I think that's some of the mental spiral that can happen yeah. in homeschooling, just figuring out how to shift it. I mean, because it should, it should be painful in real life, irresponsibility results in pain. Yeah. In some way. And so it should be painful. It's just figuring out what that looks like. Like I was thinking about the thing you guys said about the Charlotte Mesa thing. And I I mean, it's true. Like people don't want to go past the class time. I don't want to go past the class time, though I'm way less formal about class times in high school anyway, because I shift a lot of the planning and response, the management to them. Mm -hmm. But I feel like those things aren't mutually exclusive. You can say, oh, you you finished your math time, move on. And you can also say, now you're doing math during playtime. Right. Yep. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be, oh, the only option is to violate my philosophy. Like, it doesn't have to be that. It could just be that you pushed it to the afternoon instead of making it them plow straight through. It's still the same thing, which is that they had to finish what they started. Right. Right. I see it as if you had done your work the way you were supposed to, Mm -hmm. you would have been done in the certain amount of time. Like I didn't over assign work or have right. too, much, too, too many expectations on you, but you chose to use your time poorly. So it's like, it's the opposite of the, you got yeah. your work done early and now have free time. <laughs> it's right. the inverse of that. And so it's totally, yeah. totally fine. And, you know, doing work on Saturdays. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Evenings, we've had evenings where the rest, yeah, the rest of us got to watch movie and have a fun game night or something like that. And lo and behold, someone was having to do their schoolwork. Right. <laughs> and, oh, get it yeah. done. and my kids are total homeschoolers where they're like, school in the evening, like horrors, <laughs> horrors. <laughs> or on Saturday, like right. sometimes I'd be like, hey guys, we're a little behind in this. We need to really step it up. Let's do some on Saturday. They're like, what? What are you talking about, mom? That's crazy. <laughs> this is when you bust out the story about how in high school you did homework every Saturday for four yeah. years. And <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> they have no idea. No, uh, no nothing. <laughs> One of the things I heard in what you guys just said is this idea, though, of also trying to figure out what's going on, because what yeah. if you are over assigning yeah. or what if this child's actually really struggling with math? Like it's not dawdling. It's they oh, yeah. literally don't get it. I mean, so it bears investigating, which mm -hmm. gets, I think that also falls into the whole quick fix thing, investigating and trying to figure out what's going on takes time also. Right. And it takes trial and error. Mm -hmm. But the error part also is what parents are trying to avoid. I mean, you should always try to avoid errors, but we often can't. <laughs> like we're going to make mistakes. Right. Yes. And you have to try things out. That's okay. Well, any parting thoughts before we move on for today? Yeah, I think the main takeaway really is it's just that if we are feeling the pain and anxiety for our kids, we're making it impossible for them to take on that responsibility and learn the lessons they're supposed to learn. So one way or another, we have to become playful and matter of fact with consequences. Mm -hmm. And with what we're trying, how we're trying to parent and set deadlines and all the things. But the minute we feel all the weight and all the pressure of the situation, we're really shooting ourselves in the foot. That's the sign that nothing that we're going to try will work. 
Yeah. I think in it's either in boundaries or seven habits of highly effective people. I think it's seven habits of highly effective people, but it's, it gives this example of these parents that come to a pastor for counseling and they're like, our son is just lazy. He won't get a job. He has all these problems. And you know, the counselor, pastor, whatever says, well, he's right. He doesn't have any problems. You've taken all the problems from him. <laughs> and like he's really content and happy with yeah. how things are going because you've eliminated everything that is problem like problems aren't a bad thing for kids to do mm. uh, yeah. right like us taking on all the problems ourselves is is the biggest issue not allowing them to ever have those consequences those struggles suffer yeah it it's that's a that's going to be a lack of maturity mm-hmm. They're never going to, they're, they're going to be those kids living in the basement playing video games, like not, you know, this, they need them. They need them for growth. It's, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. And if that feels mysterious or like, I don't know, like that's me, but I don't know what to do about it. Step one is read bad therapy. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah. Good. <laughs> good advice. <laughs> well, with that. I think I'll thank you for coming and recording with me today. Yes, that was a good conversation. Way to kick off the season. That's it for today. Thank you so much for listening and being a part of the Sisterhood of the Podcast. Please make sure you are following us in your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed today's episode... Share it with a friend and then discuss it with her. This is a great way to continue the conversation. All of the books and things we mentioned today are linked in our show notes. Just go to scolaysisters.com slash SS144 to check it out. Don't forget to register for our annual homeschool essentials retreat. We cannot wait to spend a whole day thinking about the subject of attention with you. And yes, we will be talking quite a bit about ADHD. Head on over to scolysisters.com slash attention and click register. That's scolysisters.com slash attention. We will return in a couple weeks with our next episode. Misty and I will be talking with Angela Reed about Latin and relationships and even how some things have changed now that we have more years of educating and thinking about educating behind us. You will love this episode. Until then, we want to remind you once again that homeschooling is a marathon you needn't run alone. So open up your eyes and look around you. Find your sisters. I have a cup of coffee with me. I was going to get myself a cup of coffee and I forgot. (laughs) It sounds like you're in a big room. I am in a little room. (laughs) I've heard of people throwing a blanket around their microphone and their computer screen and themselves while recording. (laughs) Or you need to make yourself a fort. I already feel like I live in a closet. Now I'm going to live in a fort in a closet. Guys, (laughs) I just can't. (laughs)